Mike Gilmetti, do you make more money on infill or more money when you do uh, greenfield development? It's not an either or. It's some, some, I mean, it depends on the project. So, I mean, we have equal opportunity for, uh, you know, providing a fair return in either uh, greenfield areas or infill areas. It really depends on the type of product um, uh, and, and the time in the market, obviously. But I will say, infill is inherently riskier. Uh, and so, on paper, we try to underwrite to a higher return because it is a lot riskier. Um, the, 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 the development approval time takes longer. The cost of capital is more expensive. The cost of financing, insurance, all the soft costs associated are all more expensive. And quite frankly, the amount of capital needed is much greater. On, uh, at, a, at a single family home, I can build you know, 2,000 square feet for you know, plus or minus $100,000. Just, just the sticks and bricks, if you will. A, a high-rise 1,000 square foot home is more like $400,000. Just the sticks and bricks. I'm not talking land. I'm not talking insurance or, or infrastructure or you know, parks or schools or anything like that. Just the cost to, to construct. Well, you can sell that high-rise for more, too. Well, I can uh, in certain markets. Uh, you know, I, I can in San Francisco. I can't in Concord. Uh, I can't in, in Novato. I can't in, um, you know, Walnut Creek. There, there are a lot sure. of places the I can't The market's not going to accept it. But in San Francisco, you can build infill, and you'll, the market rewards it. In certain cases, yes. Not over the last few years, but yes. <laughs> okay. As a report, what can governments do to address the cost of capital, the time that, that uh, Michael Medi is just talking about, the, the red tape to get through, to get these things from planning up out of the ground? Well, any plan that goes forward is going to have to be built by the private sector. And what, what has happened in the past is that all the burden of planning conflicts or governmental regulations has been placed on the developer. The developer has to fix all the government documents so they're consistent, has to provide all the infrastructure that wasn't accounted for by utility rates, uh, has to c completely please the community for that one project, um, e e even though it's, it's, it's benefiting a whole neighborhood. Um, and it's a completely unsustainable burden for the private sector to take on. Uh, so what has to happen as we identify these neighborhood plans is for the government sector basically to get its act together and provide all of the necessary planning tools that resolve all the policy conflicts, gets the whole area entitled for growth, refreshes it every three years so it doesn't have to be redone, and allows the project developer to go in just on their individual project issues alone which should be relatively insignificant, and then protect against lawsuits in the future. And what's good about the sustainable community strategy is that it did shift the legal burden if we can make the proper finding from what was something called the fair arguments test where anyone with $2,500 could argue anything and then the case would go forward and it could be held up as much as four years where the developer loses the benefits of the development cycle and the revenue and can't estimate what the project's worth anymore to something called the substantial evidence test which says that if the governmental entity has substantial evidence to back its finding, the case can be dismissed. That's a huge potential benefit that would resolve a lot of the issues um, that I think are frivolous. Because what's most important is that the project be properly planned. But that should be done on a neighborhood level, not on an individual project level.